Okay, so today I thought I would get outside of my comfort zone a bit and give a talk about the, the principle of the boarding school syndrome. I only actually really came across this term last night. I essentially I received a call from my old school two days ago um, and the school that I went to was a boarding school and this is something that I've not shared in my videos before it's not necessarily felt relevant on one level and also it's an area that is quite painful and it's a wounding for me So I've not really given it much thought, but um, yeah, a couple of days ago I got a phone call in the evening uh, from my old school and it felt a bit strange. They're saying to me, hmm, you know, how are you getting on, what are you up to, such and such, and it's like, well, what do you want? Essentially they were calling to ask for money from me. So I said to them, you know, I didn't actually enjoy my time in boarding school. Uh, it was very painful. And I explained where I was at and what came up for me and, you know, they listened. In fact, it was it was the, the head boy who had just finished who was calling me. And, you know, but he couldn't really hear, I guess he was, yeah, where he was at. And yeah, even after I tell, told him all that, he was, was still asking me for money. And when I said, you know, I can't really afford it, he said to me, oh, what about a one-off donation? And it's just like, ow, <laughs> ow. So I looked online last night and looked up boarding school and it came up this word syndrome. So I thought, oh, I'll have a look. Because when I've looked up, you know, uh, issues around boarding school that I found very little over the years. Um, and therefore it was interesting to see that and I saw that a new book has come out uh, in the last period of time. Again, I've not done the research. It's called Boarding School Syndrome. Um, basically calling the wounding of the privileged child. And about a by a lady called Joy Shevin, I think S H S C H something like that, who's a Jungian analyst. And yeah, brought up it's like wow, okay. So this is not something I've shared about. And I thought, hmm, good good to, to share my own experiences. And for those of you who have been to boarding school, maybe just to give you food for thought. So where to start? Okay, to start, essentially what I feel with boarding school is that we go through three main stages. Well, after we've left, we kind of, and this is where I feel a lot of people are in, is it's denial. So that's for me the first step is, is denial. And this was my own experience of boarding school after I left. Certainly after I left I had nightmares for probably six months about my experience there. Like I was like, whoa, realising just how much I disliked it. Then a period of time went by and I just kind of forgot about this. And I just went into that, that feeling that our boarding school was fine, there was no problem there, it was like, yeah, no worries. I went into that space of denial. No problem, no problem. But what was happening internally, well, was very different. And what I found, well, I won't go into my story quite yet, but, so, I've, the first step is denial about boarding school. We, we deny that, um, it was challenging for us. You know, we can say, oh yeah, yeah, it was quite difficult, but I got through it. But there's no connection to our emotions. And I'll speak about that in a bit. So the second level, I think, 
is once we actually connect with our emotions and our feelings, once we start to maybe to do therapy or we start to, to do a little bit of introspection, we realise, well, actually, I really hate boarding school. So that's the second level of the hatred. Uh, and what else do I call it? It's a repulsion. It's like just you know thinking everybody who goes to boarding school is you know messed up for the rest of their lives. So that's kind of for me the second level, and that's where I was at for many years of just really hating. And I couldn't believe how much abuse I had received, not necessarily physically, but emotionally. And not necessarily from other people, but mainly from myself. That's what I was trained. So that's the f so first level is uh, denial. Second level is repulsion. And the third level, and this is something I felt really good to share today. Because I feel that uh, the picture we're painting and we're receiving at the moment about boarding schools is just those first two levels of denial and then repulsion. And I've not read um, this new boarding school syndrome book. Uh, I have read the book uh, Boarding School Survivors by Nick Duffel, I believe his name is. And that's very powerful and very life-changing for me. I read it about 15, 13 years ago. And that was really one around the time where I was waking up that actually, yeah, maybe I didn't enjoy boarding school. So that's where I feel we're at, you know, at the moment, is those first two levels. That it's like, in this book, The Boarding School Syndrome, we're painting this picture of the abuse which has gone on, and the, you know, the terrible stories. What I feel is the next level, and this is really something really important I want to share with today, is... We have to eventually move to the third level, which is about really, what do I call it? Um, yeah, seeing it as the greatest gift, boarding school. Now, you know, and eventually loving it. Even though, you know, you've suffered all of this hurt and this hatred and this, this you know, these terrible things going on, is eventually loving this experience. And I'm not seeing this yet. I've not read the book, so I don't know if she then talks about it. But, you know, that's my sense, is that we're, we're kind of seeing it as a terrible thing, or, you know, we're, we're just saying, oh, they're all, it's all lies, it's rubbish. And I feel that, for me now, my own experience of boarding school, is that it really messed me up. You know, that... Uh, Personally, I did, I think, seven years of therapy. Uh, and dealing with this, and I worked with Jungian analysts, um, some of the, you know, the best in the country, and uh, it, it, it shifted me. It, it kind of, uh, from going from denial, I then went into this hatred and going, oh my God, what had I gone through? And allowing the emotions to bubble up. And then I went in, Start, have started to go into these last few years really appreciating seeing that it is my greatest gift because it is my wounding and how I like to relate this to how I like to bring this in is the the teachings of Ajahn Chah which when I was starting to go through my trauma around boarding school I was living in a, an Ajahn Chah Buddhist monastery and this is where I had my breakdown and break through potentially, which uh, is open to question maybe, but I feel, yeah, I certainly broke through something. And what Ajahn Chah used to relate to when he was in uh, teaching the Thais and the, the Westerners, the Thai people would say, why are you being so hard on, actually no, that's a different story, but he was just relating to the fact that um, the Thai monks their emotional household was a bit like a grass hut. And he said for them to clean up their emotional household is very easy. They've had very little suffering in quite a, a simple life. And sweep their, their grass hut and it's clean. 
and then they can sit in meditation and they can be get into wonderful blissful states um, but he was saying they don't necessarily have the capacity and the ability to relate to other beings because they don't know what suffering really is they don't know what it's like to be away from family or to be uh, uh, to be wounded and they might be able to get great samadhi uh, be able to get into deep blissful spaces but uh, to relate to other humans to to be able to support others and have that compassion he said that you know they don't necessarily have that he said on the other hand western monks are a bit like a an old country house that um, is filled with rooms and as you start to do your practice and as you start to do your meditation you start to clean out those rooms and you think, oh yeah, I'm getting somewhere, I've cleaned out a room, and when you do that, you get to that point, you suddenly realize there's another room, and then another room. He said, once they've done a few years of practice, they then have the ability to relate, to have compassion for those who have suffered. He, you then, they then have the ability to um, able to accommodate other people. You know what suffering is, so therefore you want to help. The, the prayer, the Buddhist prayer, you know, may all beings be well, really sits in your heart when you've been through suffering. And the teacher Ajahn Brahm says about his teacher Ajahn Chah, he says, you know, he obviously went through deep, deep suffering because he was such a wise teacher. Saying that the deeper the suffering you've gone through, the wiser the potential you have to be. Now, how I see boarding school is that a lot of us who have been through boarding school have these castles. <laughs> we have really so much baggage, so many different rooms to clear out. And yet, as we start to do that, we have such wisdom. We have such open hearts. I mean, I feel so appreciative to boarding school because I was so shut down. I mean... My own uh, life experience was I grew up with an alcoholic father. I hated being at home. And therefore, to go to boarding school was wonderful to get away. For the first three weeks, I loved it. And then after three weeks, it was like, oh, I've had enough. It was like summer holiday camp. I was like, okay, I've had enough. I want to go home. And, and I couldn't. I couldn't go home. When I said I was homesick, it was like, oh, you'll get over it, Piers. And the reality is, when I was at a boarding school, you know, I was so worried about being bullied that my name, when I grew up, was Piers. When I got to boarding, boarding school, I changed my name to my, my, my second name, Simon. And then, essentially, it became Simon, it became Siggy, it became Ziggy. So, my name at school... For most of my time was Ziggy, Ziggy Cross, and it really, <laughs> it kind of affects me. <laughs> but there's like that part of me which has disappeared on one level. It's like, I, you know, I've done a lot of work, it's like been 18 years now that I've been doing this self-development work and yet I still got these rooms to clear out and probably one of them is facing Ziggy that very angry aggressive young man and I assure you I've you know come across different aspects of myself but he's still there so you know I was called Ziggy for seven years of my life as soon as I left boarding school changed my name back to Piers almost instantaneously it was like uh, I wouldn't say schizophrenia but it was like splitting my personality right right. that that was boarding school so yeah so I think, you know, boarding school's amazing. I really do. I wouldn't send my children there now. I think there are other ways and we're, we're coming to the end of this cycle. I think 
we're starting to wake up as a culture and a society. And you go to other countries in the world, like Germany, or you know, I've been to a few where you tell them about boarding school, and they think you're crazy. I you know, and and yet in in England and the countries that we've we've gone to over the years, like India or. Australia, where these other boarding schools have, have popped up. You know, if you question boarding school as being a, not a good thing, then, you know, you're shouted at. Maybe that's why I've not shared, because of fear of what people will say, but I don't care about them anymore. What I care is sharing from my heart, and I know that what I feel about boarding school now is that there are some who, who enjoy it, who get something out of it. There are some who are indifferent. And there's some who really suffer at boarding school. And what I feel, just looking at the amount of literature there is out about boarding school and the trauma of it, you know, is that there are a lot of people who are just in denial, who are uh, not in touch with that. Until this new book came out in the last few months, it was one book that I could find and there was one article, I think by the same lady, this Jungian analyst, about boarding school. I mean, that's really incredible. I know, and, uh, my Jungian analyst, who I worked with up in Scotland for a few years, you know, she said she, she was in her 80s when I worked with her, and she'd worked with Jung and Aniela Jaffe, and she said, you know, she'd never met anyone been traumatised by boarding school. I know. Someone did point out to me a few years later that um, you know, that's going to be the case because she was a therapist. But interestingly enough, I found out years later on that her husband was in the same school as me. <laughs> Which is like, ah, oh, okay. Interesting how things click together. So yeah, so I want to say this is my experience. That, you know, I really suffered there. And it's interesting if someone was to look at what I was like at school, I was awful. You know, how I coped with boarding school was um, to internalise my father. So although I tried to escape from my father, who was this alcoholic, aggressive, violent person, I went to boarding school and to get away from him. But in order to cope with being around these, these boys who... You know, you're vying for position, you know, you don't have really any adults around to to put down firm boundaries, to give you love. Because a lot of the teachers, certainly that I was at school with, they were all from boarding school as well. So if you went to them, you said, you know, I'm really upset. He said, oh, you'll get over it. Because what you're doing is you're triggering their stuff about boarding school. So, you know, uh, something else which came up at boarding school is those kids that... Uh, ran away. They ran away to get away from boarding school. They were brought back by their parents. So it was like just seeing that there was no way out. I know. And my own personal experience with my father, um, because he was an alcoholic, he had cirrhosis of the liver, and he was very close to death. And I was told by my family that you go to boarding school, if anything happens to your father, then at least you're going to get an education. So, you know, I didn't have a choice. I want to leave. It's like, well, you can't leave. You're there because of your father. And the choice, the reality is, is I chose. So I chose to go, which at the beginning, when I was starting to bubble up this stuff about boarding school, it was incredibly painful. To think, I chose this. I chose to go through this abuse, to go through this, this horror. <laughs> and, yeah. So, so going back to what I was like at school. So, what happened was, I internalised this this alcoholic father. So, I, I became quite a bully to myself, but also to other people. I just went silent. I was just kind of this aggressive, silent, silent and aggressive type. People just kept away from me. Uh, no one hassled me. You know, 
every now and again I would get hassle, and if I'd been drinking then, uh, yeah, I remember punching a few people. Yes, yes, my mouse squeaking there. So, yeah, so essentially I wasn't a very nice person. Uh, I didn't have basically any friends at school. I mean, So if this feels a little bit fractured, that's because I've not prepared this, I'm just coming from my heart, what comes up, which might be rubbish, but there we go. So on one level I was kind of, people say I was lucky at school because I was good at sports, so there was a certain element that you know, people respected me because I was good at sports kind of cool but you know I was still hurting inside I was yeah really hurting inside and after leaving school I went through a few years of you know not really being very shut down I think that was one of the main things of boarding school is I became emotionally shut down I could not you know love my parents when I was at school I think I saw them once, twice, three, once, twice. I think I saw them three times a term. That was like to start off with just a day visit. And because I lived quite far away, you know, my, my parents would come up, so we'd sit in a cafe. And then we'd go home at half term, and then I'd have another one. So. It might have been more regular, but I think that was roughly it. In a 12-week term, then I went home maybe three times. So I learnt to cope. So because I couldn't love them because they weren't there, I just had to just shut that part down. And I remember how I used to deal with it was when I would start to cry or something would come up, I'd just physically go, you, and I'd swear, and you stupid little shit. You know, I'd use the father side of me to, to suppress that side until eventually you know, it disappeared. But what happened as I left boarding school, I started in relationships. In certain times, these things would bubble up, especially when I'd been taking drugs and drink, and I got quite into drink. And I, if I'm honest, I thought I was crazy. I would see things, I would, you know. And there was a time when I went to, to book to see a psychiatrist. And looking at what happened uh, in the monastery, I think possibly I would have been locked up because of how I was. I mean, how I started to deal with being in the monastery and working with these therapists, with these Jungian analysts, what started to come up was just this rage. And I'd always... You know... Being this, this good boy, you know, keeping a you know, tough exterior and, you know, that's certainly what I took on after leaving school, became a, a good boy and I, I did what my family needed and I did this and I did that and never hurt anybody else and I never was angry at anyone and it was like very much this, this shut down person. As this started to bubble up when I was in the monastery, I felt this anger and what happens, I started to again internalise it I started to self-harm. I started to use knives and physically, because I liked, I was do, used to do martial arts, so I used to physically beat myself uh, with my around my head and my body, and that went on for probably about a year, year and a half. And I think in that time I went to A and E for about 
about four times for different broken bones. I, think I broke my, my fist here, broke a rib, broke this hand, I broke my foot, which was something slightly different. I went, I'd sliced open my arm here. And sh yeah. What happened was, eventually, I, I kind of just beat myself up so much that I, 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 I got ME, MS, not ME, MS. I mean, ME or chronic fatigue. So I couldn't get out of bed, which was a blessing. I couldn't beat myself anymore. I didn't have the energy for that. That, that anger had burned out. So I had to find a different way. So this is not comfortable for me to do this, but I feel that mm, this is my, my story, this is my journey. But what I really want to say is that although this, you know, going through this suffering, um, I don't know, in, in the monastery, I tried to commit suicide quite a few times. I still have, you know, scars on my wrist from razor blades. I just couldn't do it. Every time I'd stick the razor blades in, it was like I just would, <laughs> and I connect in with that really raw part. I couldn't do it. <laughs> I couldn't go ahead with it. And as I spent more time in the Buddhist monastery, it was like receiving the teachings that if you commit suicide, then according to their, the Buddha's teachings, is you commit suicide, you go into a hell realm. So whatever you feel at the moment of death, that you know, and to commit suicide according to them is the worst thing ever because you're uh, you're in such pain, such kind of, and you're hurting the self. He said, they, you know, the Buddha said, you go into a hell realm and you stay there, feeling that same feeling you felt on death for eons, lifetimes. And so no matter how bad I felt, I just, after that, I was like, well, I can't kill myself. And I couldn't leave the monastery because I was such a mess. Um, and Ajahn Chah used to give the teaching of when you can't go forward and you can't go back and you can't stand still, this is where you practice, this is where you awaken. And I remember one time feeling such pain, it was like I couldn't think of the past because it was going, going through abuse and like sexual abuse, it was like all of this stuff coming up, it was like I couldn't go past. <laughs> and I couldn't go to the future because I had no life, I had no experience, I had no friends, I had nothing. You know, I couldn't go future. It was too painful to think that do I have to go through this anymore? And I couldn't stay, you know. And I couldn't be in the present because it was so painful. And this was the point where it was like, boom. Really awakening to the moment. You know, and if that was a glimpse of a spiritual awakening essence of enlightenment then yeah, it was powerful it was like wow there was no other moment but now and it didn't last maybe a few about 20 minutes half an hour and then you know So why I share these things is it's kind of it's time for me to share who I am, and the reality is, is I, you know, I have known great wounding, and there are 
be many people who will mock me. And there will be others who go, oh, thank you for sharing that. I was sharing this when I visited the monastery a few weeks ago. And one of the guys I was talking to, and I was saying about me self-harming, he says, oh, you know, thank you for sharing. It's like, I don't think I've ever heard anyone share that. And he said, I used to self-harm as well. But I've never shared any, I've never told anyone that. <laughs> it's like, yeah, this is the first noble truth in Buddhism. There is suffering. There is suffering. It's not I suffer or he suffers. It's like it's like there is suffering that we all suffer. So, you know, as the Buddha used to say, that is there a path out of this boarding school stuff? I mean, if you have gone to boarding school and you know. You're struggling, and how would I say struggling? It's like, if you've got a, in a relationship, whether a man or woman, and um, they find you shut down, that they say, I just can't get close to you. It's like, yeah, there is a part of you which is shut down. And I would suggest, and this is what I believe from reading the reviews of boarding school syndrome, She's talking that although boarding school has changed nowadays, that there isn't the uh, the external deprivations that um, I saw a little bit of, but people in the 60s or 50s got huge amounts of you know abuse and things like that, physical, mental. It was like a, it's still this emotional abuse that we we receive in boarding school that. It's not necessarily the teachers, but it's ourselves doing it to us in order to survive in uh, a scenario like Lord of the Flies, where, you know, it's dog eat dog and you don't have the, the protection of the parents to go, actually, no, you stay away from my kids. Or um, it was like getting away. The one thing with boarding school compared with normal schools is. If you had a tough time at school, you'd come home, you'd go to your room, you have some privacy, you could cry, you could you could yeah, get away. Boarding school, you know, okay now you have doors, but I don't think I had a door on anything from well, the upstairs toilets didn't have doors. My cubicle didn't have doors, but I had a partition. I didn't get a door till I was sixteen. That was five years with, uh, with basically no privacy. <laughs> and even at 16 I was sharing with someone else. So only when I got 17 the last year that I had a door <laughs> where I could actually close the door and go, there you go, uh, this is my room, this is my space. So yeah, so if you're in this position, it's like, what can we do? So how do we turn it from, you know, second stage, which is repulsion, hatred of boarding school, into into third stage of loving this place, seeing what a gift it is, seeing it as a gift of kind of garnering great wisdom. I feel if if those who run British society, I mean, most of the politicians were boarding school. Most of the bankers, the uh, you know, the the people in charge of this country, business, all levels, were boarding school. You know, I see quite a lot of them who went to my school in the papers and um, yeah, actors, or they're this, or they're that. Uh, I was watching the latest um, big Hollywood blockbuster, and it's like, oh, yeah, I was at school with that guy. I remember him. So yeah, what can we do? The first thing I would suggest to people, if you've you know gone through boarding school and it's it's been traumatic, or maybe you'd like to, you know, your life's, you know, you don't quite feel right, that you can't cry, you can't let go, then I would suggest finding a, a really good Jungian analyst. Yeah, I mean, I spent. Yeah, like I say, I spent seven years doing therapy, and for about two of those years, I saw counselors, I saw psychotherapists, I saw um, psychosynthesis, which is an, uh, uh, 
substream of therapy. I saw all different types of uh, therapists, and they just couldn't couldn't break through the walls that I built up. It was useless, really, the first few years. And I remember reading a poem to one of my counsellors, and she burst into tears because she was so kind of like, "Oh my God, I can't believe the you know what you've been through." And for me, it was like. It was, I had like power over her. It was only when I started working with this Jungian analyst um, up in Scotland and I started to, she started to kind of push against me. I had someone to push against and we started to work with my dreams and looking at my unconscious. And it was then I saw what I was like. And one of my greatest healings was she started to, get me to write down my dreams every night and I remember for a year I used to wake up crying you know having a nightmare every night for about a year and I would write those dreams down everything from torture to being shot to being you know everything you could imagine it was like now I was listening to my unconscious it was like yeah here you go Piers it was incredibly painful. So that's what I'd recommend. First step, you know, find yourself a Jungian analyst. And it's expensive, but, you know, we live half lives. We're like zombies. That's what I feel boarding school produces zombies. Yeah, great for ruling the empire. Why do you think Britain was able to, uh, to spread across the world? Because you had these people who were quite comfortable being away from home, from family, and dealing with whatever was thrown at them. You know, deprivation. Um, certainly that's the theory that Nick Duffel puts across, and it makes total sense to me, you know. Um, I realise this is turning out to be a really long film, <laughs> which I wasn't intending to, to be. I guess this is like a a couple of hours if you're not a day workshop really because you know I could tell you all the things I've done over the years and I'm still working on it I still got my stuff and fortunately you know I have an amazing woman who's so patient with me uh, I still got my stuff coming up I still go into my controlling pans that's one of our things I see we're a bit like recovering alcoholics that we we try to control everything. You know, we, everything's got to be our way, and in relationship, that's pretty challenging. You know, no, you've got to do it this way. No, no, don't do it that way. No, I, you know, I can get annoyed with my partner because she's not doing it my way. So, f yeah, first thing, finding a Jungian analyst. The next thing I've said is, you know, meditation. Start to to train our minds. So look at some of my other videos about how to meditate and you know, some of the guided meditations. That starts to train our mind to hmm, just allow the space for things to bubble up. And I wouldn't recommend a lot of meditation, certainly if it, I found meditating a lot quite challenging. Just a, you know, a little bit of meditation just helps us start to train the mind, bringing it back to the breath, slowing everything down, allowing the space in the heart, you know, the crusts and the exoskeleton around our body and our hearts to just start loosening. The next thing I would suggest to people is creativity. That was one of the things that my Jungian analyst got me to work with, is painting. I had started off painting black and white, and she says, start using colour. So I did, and, you know, uh, that's something that I love doing nowadays, is just love painting in colour. I don't do it as much, but certainly whenever I've been really traumatised or something really big's coming up, then I'll paint. And, uh, yeah, I've got probably a hundred paintings up in the attic. I rarely show them to people. They're very abstract, like, very expressive. So, you know get a piece of paper, I think I've got some videos on YouTube about painting creatively, you know, just 
stick a big piece of cardboard on the floor, get some paints, you know, it could be just poster paint, and just splat allow this this feeling, allow the little child, allow that part of you which is not had the nourishing up and out. Yeah, so creativity, so you've got the painting, you've got poetry, write poem. You know, um, do, do some writing, and then just do stream of consciousness, you know, boarding school was like this, or whatever, and just write, don't take your pen off the page. What you'll find, what you possibly will find, as I found, is I really struggle to write because I feel such rage, and I, I couldn't write anything, I'd stick holes in the page, it's like, so that's why painting was a bit better, because especially with cardboard, you could rip holes in it, express what I was feeling, and, and that's, yeah, channeling the, the anger, you know, get yourself a punch bag, get in touch with that, and the monastery I started doing my martial arts, really kind of feeling that anger that I felt, especially with certain boys in my school who just picked on me, you know, the older years, it's like, oh, the hatred, feeling that, not necessarily throwing it back at them, just feeling it within myself, that's my anger, which I hold, which I carry, which is by poison in my blood, and then this is something which is really, kind of came from my teacher, about anger, like anger is just energy and yet when you're really in it when you've suppressed it like a lot of boarding school people have for years because you know that if you get into anger then that's when everyone comes out and jumps on you and rips you because they want to see you explode because they find it funny it's like you learn to suppress it so I suppressed my anger and when it came out it's like so knowing that it is just energy but Although someone told me, the abbot told me that it's just energy, it didn't really make much difference, it just, I was livid. So it's channeling that in a benevolent way, going running, or go for a walk, uh, do some martial arts, something, channel it, channel it in a positive way rather than letting it sit and fester into the, you know, depression or uh, terrible feelings inside. Um, yeah, singing, dancing, you know, kind of embodying it. I think five rhythms is a really good way of just embodying that. Oh, yeah, what do I feel? And dancing through it, clearing, doing that regularly once a week. Um, and the last thing, I mean, there's probably thousands of other things that I've used over the years, but last thing I think today is, is about spirituality, is that, when we see that there is a reason for this, there is a reason that I've been through such intense suffering. You know, you couldn't believe, you know. But that's the thing is you do believe if you're watching this and you've been to boarding school or you're with a partner who's been to boarding school and you can see in their eyes that they really suffer. It's like, this is our gift. If we are willing to face it or if we bring awareness to this gift, you know, Einstein said the most important question we can ask ourselves is, is this a friendly universe? And for me, I've questioned whether it's friendly. A lot of my life it's like, bullshit, it's the most horrible, shitty place I could imagine. But as you go through it and you bring awareness into, as I bring awareness into that feeling of suffering, it opens up more doors, it opens up and clears more rooms out. I still have so much to clear out. <laughs> so much work to do. And part of me, that fills me with <laughs> real fear. <laughs> I don't want to do it. <laughs> but it's like, just keep going. Whatever you're at, wherever you're at in life, just keep going. <laughs> we're all these sacred souls, we're these amazing beings, and yet... <laughs> This suffering that we've gone through, if it's boarding school, it's your greatest gift. 
And when we plow it down into the crucible of the heart, it's like you've got the potential to have the most amazing shiny diamond of a heart. At the moment it's encrusted in coal and yuck and gack. But once you clean away the dross, it's like, wow, you're just going to be amazing, a leader. A leader of, of men and women bringing this, this world, which has been you know, a dark place for, for a long time on one level. Bring it into the light again while we, we act consciously. We act with love, with compassion, kindness. And so spirituality, having that, that sense that there's a bigger picture. Karma, you know, the Buddhist teachings, especially the Thai forest tradition, that was what the tradition I lived in for three years. You know, when I came out, I was a different man. Okay, it helped doing therapy and doing all the work that I was doing. But... Yeah, having that, that spiritual understanding like karma. Seeing that, God, I really was a horrible person. I did some bad things in my last life to, to do this, to have this lifetime. And yet, you know, someone else could say, well, actually, maybe I was a very benevolent, wise monk or wise person. And I thought, right, I really need to suffer in this lifetime to, to really understand people's pain and suffering. So having that, that spiritual basis there, that you, there's a bigger picture to this. You suffer, yes, and yet there is a path out of this suffering. As the Buddha talks about in the Fourth Noble Truth, the Eightfold Path, of right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, right livelihood. These things of you know, kindness, compassion, love, you can cultivate these, you know. My heart was totally shut down. I could not feel love. I felt love for nobody. That was 2002 when I first realized that, that I did not love a soul. And now my heart is, I really feel love now. And it's amazing. It's kind of powerful. And I have an amazing woman. It's possible. We can heal. Now I've got a long way to go. <laughs> this is this lifetime. <laughs> keep falling over and I keep picking myself up just as you will keep falling over and you will keep picking yourself up it's like baby steps just be so gentle and kind you've been so harsh with yourself all these years you think you're a shit you're a bastard you're not you're an amazing being and when you start clearing out those rooms you clear out the self-loathing with and put self-love in it No being is worthy of hatred. Ajahn Brahm says, there's no such thing as evil in the world, it's just stupidity. You know, I've just been very stupid in this lifetime to have treated the, me the way that I treated myself and therefore those around me. Wow, so I didn't expect <laughs> I didn't expect to give a talk like this <laughs> and it's going to take me great courage to put this up Sometimes we have to face our fears, and this is mine, of what you think of me, what others think of me, of upsetting others. So, yeah. I think 
who have been talking 50 minutes now. Incredible. I think I usually only give a talk for 10 minutes. Right, so, that's just the beginning really. There's probably a whole workshop of stuff in there. Uh, I just want to say, uh, you know, if I can get through it, and I assure you, it's not been easy. If I can do it, you can too. No matter where you're at, even if it's on your last legs, you know, you're feeling suicidal or whatever, then, you know, just keep going. Keep keep going. Can I, don't stop. You have such wisdom. You're on the precipice of greatness, of great love, great compassion, great kindness. So thank you, I feel very blessed and honoured that you've listened to this. If I indeed put this up, I would like to. And... Yeah. You're, you're brave, you're wonderful, just keep going. You're a beautiful, amazing soul. So be well. Blessings, blessings, blessings.